Hello, thank you so much for attending the talk today. Uh, I wanna say that we're gonna be talking a lot about um, the therapeutic pipeline. And we're gonna focus today on age-related macular degeneration for one hour. So I've tried to make the presentation um, as comprehensive as possible, but that means that uh, sometimes we can get into the level of detail that maybe some of us would like. Uh, in addition, because our attendees today are uh, spanning the spectrum from trainees and medical students to seasoned retina specialists, um, some of this may seem uh, a little primary, but I wanted to provide information that would be relevant to uh, some of our uh, newer or um, our trainees as well. <clears throat> These are my disclosures. And I'd like to begin with a audience question. So which medications do you use for the treatment of neovascular age-related macular degeneration? And I'm gonna ask you to select all that apply. Okay, so we can see that uh, biosimilars is about 7%, and uh, bevacizumab, ranibizumab, and afilbrecept are um, all uh, over 50%, with bevacizumab being the highest. We do have some users of brolicizumab and furosemab. Next question, what is your preferred treatment for new vascular or wet age-related macular degeneration? So please select one for this one. If you had just one option, what would you select? Because we have a global audience here, I think it's important um, to understand before we get started, what is currently being used and what the needs are going forward. So go ahead and put in your selection. Okay. So we have uh, bevacizumab and afibrocept at uh, 33 and 36%, and then ranibizumab at 24%. All right, next question. We're going to focus now on diabetic macular edema for, for a few minutes. Um, so which treatment do you use for diabetic macular edema? And again, I'm going to ask you to select all that apply, um, because there's a lot of options for the treatment of diabetic macular edema, we had to break this down into two questions. So you'll see that the injectables are in question one, and then the, um, the other options are in question two. But go ahead and select all that apply in terms of what treatments you use currently for diabetic macular edema. Okay, so for diabetic macular edema, we see a much higher percentage of bevacizumab followed by afibrocept and then ranibizumab. Uh, biosimilars are still coming in at 7%. And then for other options for treatment, um, we do see that the dexamethasone intraocular implant is used at a fairly high level, followed by intraocular steroid injections and subtenons, steroid injections. Um, focal and grid layers, laser are also used quite a bit in this group of, of attendees. Okay, very good. And now we're gonna look at what is your preferred treatment for diabetic macular edema. So in this se uh, section, just pick one. Um, if you had to only pick one option, for the treatment of diabetic macular edema, what would you choose? Okay, so we'll go ahead and close that. And here we see um, bevacizumab at the top of the list, followed closely by a fibrocept. And then here we see that dexamethasone intraocular implants significantly higher than focal or grid laser. 
followed by intraocular steroid injections. Okay, very good. So we're gonna begin the discussion with a brief overview of age-related macular degeneration and diabetic macular edema. And before I begin, I, I just do wanna say that uh, I understand that this is a little bit biased um, in terms of availability. I know that uh, what we're gonna talk about today, um, the treatment options are not available worldwide, but I think it's important that we understand everything that is available um, because these are things that we are going to have access to uh, at some point. So <clears throat> we know that macular degeneration is the leading cause of severe and irreversible visual loss worldwide. And about 8.7% of the global population is affected by macular degeneration. The disease has a profound effect on the quality of life of affected individuals, and not just the individuals, but their loved ones. Um, it represents a major socioeconomic challenge for societies due to the exponential increase in life expectancy as well as environmental risks. This is a graphic showing macular degeneration worldwide. And you can see that these numbers are quite incredible. Um, we see it everywhere and it is um, affecting every part of the globe. Risk factors for um, macular degeneration include cigarette smoking, which is the biggest modifiable risk factor um, because we know that cigarette smoking can actually triple the risk of progression to wet or new vascular macular degeneration. Uh, Caucasians uh, are at the highest risk, but certain subsets of macular degeneration are found in Asian populations. Obesity, atherosclerosis, and genetic factors also play a significant role. We know that macular degeneration is a disease spectrum. So in the past, we would think about macular degeneration as uh, bimodal, uh, dry or wet. Um, but as we understand more about macular degeneration, we know that in early macular degeneration, it's characterized by multiple small drusen and RPE abnormalities that can progress to intermediate macular degeneration where we can see large drusen um, and further retinal pigment epithelium changes. In late macular degeneration, we have geographic atrophy or new vascular or wet AMD. Uh, geographic atrophy is characterized by the progressive loss of photoreceptors, uh, the RPE and the underlying choriocapillaris. And we know that new vascular or wet AMD is characterized by the formation of choroidal new vascularization. So let's just look at non new vascular AMD for a second. This is also called dry or inactive AMD. And we know that the prevalence of AMD increases with age. In the Beaver Dam eye study, for example, Caucasians were found to have only a 4% prevalence of AMD by age 54. However, that number increased to 46% by age 75. A small subset, uh, approximately 10 to 15%, of those with dry macular degeneration may convert to wet or new vascular macular degeneration. And we know that geographic atrophy is the advanced form of non-new vascular or non-exudative AMD. So the pathophysiology of GA or geographic atrophy is multifactorial and it involves a combination of environmental and genetic risk factors. Numerous mechanisms have been implicated, including oxidative damage, chronic inflammation, excessive accumulation of lipofusion, and malfunctioning of the complement system. 
the pathway of AMD disease progression begins with medium drusen in early macular degeneration, followed by large drusen shown here in, in uh, intermediate macular degeneration. We then see retinal pigment epithelium migration and drusenoid pigment epithelial detachments. Finally, we can see chororetinal atrophy, which is seen in geographic or late stage dry macular degeneration. Geographic atrophy is the progressive loss of retinal photoreceptors, RPE, and the underlying choriocapillaris, leading to irreversible loss of visual function. In the photo in the top left, we see a normal eye with fundus autofluorescence, below that optical coherence tomography, and below that color fundus photography. On the upper right, we see a patient with geographic atrophy on fundus autofluorescence. Below that, we can see the irregularities in the retinal pigment epithelium layer. <clears throat> and then below that on the color fundus photography. Uh, geographic atrophy, as you can see, is defined by the presence of sharply demarcated lesions of the outer retina. And sometimes we look at macular degeneration and think about, um, you know, you know, when we, we see patients, we'll say, um, you know, dry macular degeneration is not that bad. It is. Um, you're lucky to have it because it's not the wet or active type of macular degeneration. But you can see that geographic atrophy and scotomas um, significantly affect a patient's day-to-day -day life. Uh, in the left panel, uh, you can see how difficult it can be to read with those areas of missing vision. In the center area, this correlates to the fundus autofluorescence. And in the right, we see a patient who may be driving with geographic atrophy. They can see and they may test well on visual acuity, but it's certainly not good vision um, without distractions to be able to drive. So <clears throat> here, the top is a baseline for three separate patients with geographic atrophy. And in the bottom panel, we see the follow-up. Now, often when we think about geographic atrophy, we may think about um, progression in five years, 10 years. But in fact, here, you can see that the progression is quite visible in just under two years. So in the top and bottom panel, you can see how much there's been progression on the left in 23 months, in the middle over 22 months, and on the right in just 16 months. This is why sometimes you will see a patient who has excellent vision, they have dry macular degeneration, they come back a year later and their vision is significantly now affected by the geographic atrophy. So now we're gonna look at wet or active macular degeneration. This is also called exudative macular degeneration because it's associated with leakage of blood and fluid into and beneath the retina. About <clears throat> central, vis uh, I'm sorry, central visual acuity loss leading to severe visual imp uh, impairment and blindness occurs in this disease. About 90% of severe vision loss where the patient's vision is 2200 or worse is actually due to new vascular macular degeneration. And 2200 or worse is considered legally blind. So it's significant. This shows new vascular macular degeneration pathophysiology. We know that it's complex, um, but it includes cell senescence of the retinal pigment epithelium, oxidative stress, lipid metabolism, inflammation, and new vascularization. In the top right image, we see a healthy retina. In the bottom right, we see what happens in macular, in 
new vascular macular degeneration, we see that the blood vasculature from the choroid extending into the retina, leading to fluid accumulation and vascular leakage. So again, when we're looking at new vascular macular degeneration, we start with medium drusen and early macular degeneration, followed by large drusen and intermediate macular degeneration. This is followed by retinal pigment epithelium changes, followed by a choroidal new vascular membrane. Here we see subretinal fluid. And then finally, a fibrovascular choroidal new vascular membrane or subretinal fibrosis. Late macular degeneration can be classified as either wet or new vascular macular degeneration, which is classified by the choroidal new vascular membrane, or geographic atrophy characterized by, by atrophic lesions. And we see that overall the prevalence of new vascular AMD and geographic atrophy are similar. And we know that 90% of diagnosed cases of macular degeneration are dry or inactive. So now let's switch gears to diabetic macular edema for a few minutes. This is the worldwide um, involvement of diabetes. You know, uh, in 1980, only about 100 million people had diabetes. But in the next 25 years, that number is going to rise to 700 million. Diabetes is a rapidly growing epidemic, and individuals are at risk for serious macrovascular and microvascular complications, including heart disease and stroke, hypertension, kidney disease, lower limb amputations, peripheral nerve disease, uh, hearing loss, periodontal disease, erectile dysfunction, depression, complications of pregnancy, and of course, eye disease. We know that diabetic macular edema affects about 21 million people worldwide. And we know that half of patients with diabetic retinopathy will develop diabetic macular edema at some point. More advanced diabetic retinopathy is a significant risk factor for sustained blindness. And we know that indigenous populations and minorities are disproportionately impacted. So risk factors for diabetic macular edema include duration of diabetes, elevated hemoglobin A1C levels. We know that a 1% increase in hemoglobin A1C can lead to a 30 to 50% increased risk of diabetic macular edema hypertension, hyperlipidemia, renal disease, obesity, and of course, smoking. So the pathophysiology of DME um, includes retinal microvascular damage co comprising, uh, compromising the blood retinal barrier, uh, which leads to leakage of plasma constituents into surrounding retinal tissue, leading to macular edema. There's ma uh, macrovascular factors and microvascular factors. So let's talk about current treatments for AMD and DME. For dry macular degeneration, we know that there's currently no treatment, prevention, is recommended, such as self-monitoring, nutrition, ARITS 2 vitamins, smoking cessation, and regular eye exams. We also talk about supportive care and low vision aids. In wet macular degeneration, anti-VEGF injections are the gold standard, but macular degeneration is a heterogeneous disease and therefore requires an individualized approach. We know that 10 to 20% of patients require injections every four weeks, and 10 to 20% of patients require injections every 10 to 12 weeks. Everyone else fall, uh, falls somewhere in between those two. For diabetic macular edema, <clears throat> we have multiple treatment options, anti-VEGF injections, um, laser photocoagulation. We also have corticosteroid options, 
And then finally, parse plane of vitrectomy in specific instances. So these are treatment recommendations for AMD and DME by the AAO, the ASRS, and your retina. We can see that for AMD, prompt treatment and anti-VEGF are the standard of care. For DME, sometimes clinical observation in uh, mild uh, cases with good visual acuity, followed again by anti-VEGF and laser photocoagulation. Anti-VEGF treatments for wet AMD that are intravitreal include ranibizumab, afibrocept, brolucizumab, and bevacizumab. This chart uh, simply shows the dosing regimens and the cost as well as the target molecules. For diabetic macular edema, ranibizumab, afibrocept, and bevacizumab are intravitreal anti-VEGF options. And again, you can see the cost per dose below. So what are some challenges in intravitreal anti-VEGF treatments, knowing that they're the go-to treatments for both new vascular AMD and diabetic macular edema? Well, we know that when we talk about unmet needs, we're talking about the burden of disease because there is a significant economic investment. There is unresolved medical legal debates about the use of off-label substances, and there are overwhelming problems in large population management. The burden of disease has turned into a burden of care. We know that anti-VEGF are effective in reducing macular edema, uh, reducing new vascularization, and ultimately improving or stabilizing sight. Unfortunately, frequent intravitreal injections are a burden for patients and their caregivers. Fear and anxiety about injections in some patients is overcome by the prospect of site preservation. Appointments for monitoring and injections are regular events that patients plan their lives around. Collectively, anti-VEGF therapy creates financial strain for both patients and caregivers. Whereas AMD patients are usually retired and on a fixed income, they rely on caregivers who take time away from their jobs to transport them to clinic visits. In DME patients, these are usually people who are working full-time jobs, so they're having to take time away from their jobs in order to receive treatment. A study was done of 75 patients with new vascular AMD, and it was found that the mean time per visit, including preparation, travel, waiting, treatment, and recovery time from the injections was almost 12 hours per patient. Two-thirds of 456 respondents in a recent 2020 survey from the Macular Society indicated that they rely on family or friends to take them to and from their regular eye clinic appointments, and they indicated an average time commitment up between one and three hours each time. So these are significant for patients and their caregivers. We also know <clears throat> that uh, real-world experiences have been different uh, when compared with clinical trials. Uh, real-world patients with new vascular AMD have been found to receive fewer injections, experience worse visual outcomes. Uh, we know that older patients are more likely to be undertreated. Patients with poor baseline visual acuity are more likely to be undertreated. And when it comes to DME, we know that they undergo less frequent monitoring in general, receive fewer injections, and experience inferior visual outcomes compared with clinical trials. This shows the real world experience in macular degeneration compared with the clinical trials. So if you look at the chart on the right, the FDA labeling data for anti-VEGF monotherapy uh, indicates that patients should receive a mean number of 8 to 12 injections per year in new vascular AMD. When we look at real-world data, we find that patients are receiving between 6 and 7 injections, and this directly impacts 
the visual acuity. So the change in uh, best corrected visual acuity from baseline for patients in clinical trials receiving eight to 12 injections per year equates to six to 11 letters gained. Whereas in real world data where patients are receiving significantly fewer injections, it's half to one letter gained. And this is also true in diabetic macular edema where patients rather than the eight to 12 injections per year are receiving six injections per year. And that correlates with the visual acuity that they ultimately have. So what about loss to follow up? Those risk factors include age, health literacy, low income, uh, lost insurance coverage, high insurance deductibles, which, you know, the patient may have insurance, they just can't afford the deductible, uh, the distance from clinic, and if a patient has unilateral injections. And this is often because um, if they're seeing well with one eye, they may not realize how important it is to follow up with their treatment regimen. For macular degeneration, we know that quality of life declines with disease severity, and this leads to a risk of falls and injury and increased risk of depression. So let's go to another audience question here. What is the greatest unmet needs regarding wet or new vascular AMD? And I'm gonna ask you to select one. So we find that the need for longer lasting therapies is definitely at the top of the list. Um, we also want um, new drug pathways beyond anti-VEGF and non-invasive therapies because nobody likes to receive intravitreal injections. Since 1999, the American Society of Retina Specialists um, has been doing a preferences and trends survey, and this has provided a yearly snapshot of its 3,000 members' preferences on a wide variety of medical, surgical, and socioeconomic topics. So they were asked last year this very question, and you can see that it fits right in with the answers that we are looking at from our audience today. The need for longer lasting therapies, followed by the need for new drug pathways, especially for dry macular degeneration, and then non-invasive therapies. So now let's move to new therapies in the retina pipeline. This has been a very hot topic looking at dual targeted therapy. Um, we know that there are many underlying uh, similarities in the pathophysiology of DME and AMD. And <clears throat> the key pathophysiological process appears to be breakdown of the blood retinal barrier. So the question is, can we combine two medications for better outcomes? and increased productivity. Bursimab um, is uh, the latest in this dual mechanism um, availability. So uh, we know that VEGF-A is secreted by RPE cells, and it has a critical role in regulating angiogenesis and vascular permeability. VEGF maintains the integrity of endothelial cells, and it's recognized as a neuroprotectant. It's also highly regulated by hypoxia. In new vascular AMD, VEGF expression mediates choroidal new vascularization, leading to leakage, hemorrhage, and subretinal fibrosis. In DME, expression of VEGF promotes retinal vascular permeability, leading to protein and fluid accumulation. The role of angiopotin 2 or ANG2 has been highly researched in the recent years. And we know that this is a focus for development of next generation therapeutics for retinal vascular disorders. 
It is involved in vascular de development and maintenance, homeostasis, inflammation. And what we have found is that VEGFA and ANG2 actually work in conjunction to regulate vascular stability and inflammation. These play an important role in DME, new vascular AMD, and retinal vein occlusion. And furosemab has a area that binds to ANG2 to reduce inflammation and vascular leakage. It also has an area which binds to VEGFA, inhibiting vascular leakage and new vascularization. This inactivated region is engineered to reduce systemic exposure and inflammatory potential. Verzumab is the first bispecific immunoglobulin-based antibody designed for the eye. It was FDA approved uh, in the United States in October of 2021, and it can bind to ANG2 and VEGFA at the same time. Um, through a novel mechanism of action, it's designed to stabilize blood vessels and reduce inflammation and leakage more than either pathway alone. There are clinical trials which have looked at furosemab in both new vascular AMD and DME. <clears throat> so the Tanaya and Lucerne trials looked at uh, about 1,300 patients and found non-inferior vision, vision gains compared with afibrocept at week 48. But the difference was that more than 50% of furosemab patients were treated every 16 weeks rather than every eight weeks. And more than 75% of furosemab patients were treated every 12 weeks rather than eight weeks. It is generally well tolerated with no safety signals. And what's really important here is that furosemab is the first new class of medications with an effective drug for wet AMD in over 15 years. So this was the study design. And you can see in the wet AMD study of Tanaya and Lucerne, the visual acuity change was very similar for both Babismo and Afibrocept. Again, the mean CSD change on OCT was also very similar, but this is comparing the Bismo every eight to 16 weeks versus a Fibrocept every eight weeks. And this is a direct answer to the need for longer lasting therapies. So patients with wet AMD at year one showed that 78% had every 12-week dosing or every 16-week dosing. Now, similar trial was done for diabetic macular edema, and this was called the Yosemite and Rhine trials, and it was a similar trial. Again, we saw non-inferior vision gains compared with a Fibrocept. More than 50% of Fibrocept patients were treated every 16 weeks versus every eight weeks. And this was the first investigational drug to achieve this level of durability, which is very exciting for our patients. Here's the study design. And again, we see that with visual acuity and with CSD change, it was very similar. So, <clears throat> dosing of the Biosmo for new vascular AMD is starting at four monthly loading doses. And then this is followed by Q4 to Q16 dosing, uh, Q16 weekly dosing, I'm sorry, depending on um, what we see in the patient's OCT and visual acuity. For diabetic macular edema, there's two options. Um, physicians can begin with four monthly loading doses or six monthly loading doses. And this is followed by 
increment extension or reduction or intervals of every eight week dosing. OPT302 is something that is not yet available. Um, however, it's a novel inhibitor of VEGFC and VEGFD or a VEGF trap. It's administered in combination with anti VEGFA therapy. So, again, a combination drug. And clinical trials have been promising. The SHORE trial looked at wet AMD. And in this study, um, the OPT302 was administered in combination with ranibizumab uh, compared with ranibizumab monotherapy. So this was the design. And again, the way that the design study was designed. And then the COAST trial also looked at neovascular AMD. However, it looks at uh, OPT302 given in combination with aflibrocept versus aflibrocept monotherapy. And the question is, when given in combination, can we go out longer between treatments? The newest um, options in the U.S. are biosimilars um, for uh, wet AMD and diabetic macular edema. I know that in other parts of the world, biosimilars have been available for about seven, eight years now, um, but it's new in the U.S. And we know that biosimilars um, are highly similar but not identical to the originator biologic, which is an FDA approved product. We know that biosimilars are not generic drug. Um, and in the US alone, it's estimated that between 2020 and 2024, the healthcare system could save an estimated $100 billion by using biosimilars as compared to the originator biologics. Um, I think these estimates are interesting and something that we certainly want to follow. But uh, in other specialties, such as oncology and rheumatology, these high estimates of cost savings have actually not panned out. Uh, there has been some savings, but uh, less than 10%. The question of biosimilar adoption in the US community. Uh, is actually likely not going to be the clinician's choice uh, because payers may mandate the use as a cost-saving measure, and they're already starting to do that. So the regulatory pathway for biologics versus biosimilars is slightly different. And <clears throat> these are not just ophthalmic, but overall biosimilars uh, in the in the biosimilar landscape that have been launched um, since 2015. This number is increasing. There are now a total of 30 FDA-approved biosimilars, and they represent 10 distinct reference products. So in oncology and rheumatology, biosimilars were adopted because they are low-cost agents. Um, priced 10 to 35 percent lower than the reference biologics and sometimes up to 40 percent. They have some familiarity with biosimilars and what they found in these subspecialties is that physicians are likely to prescribe a biosimilar if they provide cost savings to the patients or if the insurance company mandates its use. These are biosimilars in the ophthalmology space. Um, the first ranibizumab biosimilar entered the market in the U.S. this year, and the first afibrocept biosimilar is expected to enter the market in 2024. So this is uh, one of the um, ranibizumab biosimilars. You can see it's um, 
tagline created to be similar with distinct value. It's uh, considered to be interchangeable uh, for all indications of um, Lucentis. <clears throat> and in terms of efficacy, we see that the study uh, out to 48 weeks showed very similar visual acuity compared with Lucentis. This is another um, ranibizumab biosimilar that has become available this year. And again, we see that the uh, baseline visual baseline um, to changes in BCVA were similar between the biosimilar and Lucentis and with changes in CST. Uh, Litanaba is not available, <clears throat> but it's a very interesting um, medication because it is a ophthalmic bevacizumab formulation. As you know, uh, bevacizumab is currently used off-label in the United States, and it is not FDA approved. Um, but we have uh, 15 years of data and experience to go along with that. Um, it is developed as an innovator therapy, not a biosimilar, and it's seeking indications for wet AMD, diabetic macular edema, and branch retinal vein occlusions. There are studies that have been done in wet AMD, RBO and DME. And the trials have um, don't have the same number of uh, patients participating, but um, the trials uh, have shown positive tendencies. The interesting thing about Litanava is that it will likely fall somewhere between where compounded Avastin pricing is and where biosimilars and biologics are. It'll be interesting to see what happens, at least in the United States, um, if Litanava becomes FDA approved and whether Bevacizumab will be used if it is an option. So let's turn now to geographic atrophy. Um, we know that vision loss in geographic atrophy is more than just the visual acuity. And we talked about how there is significant lesion growth in less time than we previously thought. These are some OCT and histologic correlations. What we have come to learn is that macular degeneration, geographic atrophy, and coital nevascularization are not mutually exclusive. So these can happen all at the same time in the same eye. And so there's some changes in terms of how we refer to macular degeneration. There are some exciting things coming uh, down the pipeline for geographic atrophy. Um, we know that the complement pathway is very complex, and we know that geographic atrophy includes genetic as well as histopathological and uh, in vitro differences. So we have found the presence of MAC indicating active activated complement in eyes with drusen, and in vitro studies have found that C5A can prime RPE cells for inflammasome activation leading to cell death. These are molecules under investigation for the treatment of geographic atrophy, so a lot of research going on in this. And um, this is one of the medications coming down the pipeline uh, for uh, geographic atrophy. So it all looks at the complement pathway. And uh, it the two um, that we know may be coming to market soon, um, both um, impact the complement pathway, but in different locations. So this is one trial gather that was done for um, the molecule. Um, they took 
sham versus two milligrams versus four milligrams. And what they found is that there was actually 27% less geographic atrophy progression when this molecule was used compared with sham in both the two milligram and the four, four milligram. This is over 18 months. There are adverse effects, but most of these adverse effects involve the same adverse effects as found in intravitreal injections. The interesting thing that came out of this study was that there was a conversion rate for choroidal neovascularization, which was higher than the sham. So you can see that the two milligram dosing had uh, six versus eight in the four milligram um, dosing and three in the sham um, dosing. And so uh, we do know that there is a higher risk of um, choroidal neovascularization conversion in these patients. And the dose, the higher dose impacts that as well. So GATHER2 is also uh, gathering information. This is a, another molecule um, which affects the complement pathway and tries to reduce progression of geographic atrophy. <clears throat> the Oaks and Derby studies were done um, and again showed reduced progression of geographic atrophy in patients who received uh, the molecule. Again, adverse effects were found to be very similar to those in intravitreal injections. And again, we saw that this with this molecule, there was also um, new choroidal new vascular um, membrane development. The Sysvimo <clears throat> ranibizumab point delivery system um, is very interesting because while it uses ranibizumab, which is a drug that we've had for many years, it is a new platform. So this is a ref refillable intraocular implant, customized formulation of ranibizumab. It's implanted surgically at the pars plana and refill exchange procedures are performed in the office approximately every six months. This is what the platform looks like. And this is what it looks like in the eye. So we see that the Sysfemo implant has very similar um, efficacy in visual acuity compared with ranibizumab given every four weeks. And this is exciting because if patients can go out six months versus four weeks for treatments, um, I, think, I think most of my patients would uh, be delighted. What is very exciting about this is that 98% of patients in the trial did not receive supplemental treatment. And the port delivery system, again, the ASRS asked about it um, who would you consider it for? Um, and most people said that it would be considered for patients that required more than eight injections per year, which makes sense. You know, if a patient does not require these in injections um, frequently, then perhaps it's reasonable to have them come to the office um, so that they don't have to undergo a surgical procedure. But for patients who are having to come in every four weeks for these injections, doing a simple surgical procedure and reducing those visits to every six months, I think would be incredible. So <clears throat> endophthalmitis levels were higher for um, the Sysfemo implant compared with intravitreal injections and things like retinal detachment, implant dislocation, and vitreous hemorrhage were found. Um, the biggest concern is conjunctival erosion or retraction, which can allow enophthalmitis or um, 
dislocation of the implant. In October of this year, um, Jen Tech did a voluntary recall of Sysfemo, so it's not currently available in the United States to be used. Um, they are working with the FDA, and there were concerns for septum dislodgement. So you can see here what that looks like. And if it's dislodged, then there's concerns about whether the medication is being released the way that we think it should be. So wrapping up here, uh, key takeaways. We know that macular degeneration and diabetic macular edema are heterogeneous diseases. Patients require individualized approaches to treatment. And we know that we have a lot to learn. But the retina pipeline offers hope for treatment and reduced burden for our patients. I'm going to open up now to questions. And I know we've had some questions submitted. Um, so if you'll give me just a moment here. Um, so uh, one participant asked, is Avastin an FDA-approved drug? Uh, F uh, Avastin is not an FDA-approved drug. Um, <clears throat> we use it because um, we have over 15 years of experience and data and clinical trials um, telling us that we can use it. Uh, because it's not FDA approved, uh, does it make clinicians uncomfortable? Yes, definitely. Um, but in surveys, uh, retina specialists and ophthalmologists have cited that the significant cost a difference between bevacizumab or Avastin and the biologic drugs um, makes it reasonable to use it despite that discomfort. Um, it's also um, required by some payers, uh, either as a step therapy or um, indefinitely. So somebody asked, what is the aim of giving medications once macular degeneration has occurred? Um, we know that there are no treatments currently for dry um, or non-exudative macular degeneration, although we talked about some of the complement inhibition um, drugs that are going to come down the pipeline. But once macular degeneration has occurred, um, we, meaning I, I assume that it has become wet or new vascular, our goal is to preserve progression our goal is to preserve loss of sight and possibly even improve vision. We know that patients can actually gain letters of vision with uh, anti-VEGF and now uh, fursimab uh, treatments. So, um, so that is the aim, to prevent progression um, and hopefully to increase um, vision. Um, on a follow-up question, someone else asked, um, you know, based on the answer to whether it is approved uh, bevacizumab, why doesn't it just get FDA approved? Well, because there is a lot of cost and um, manpower involved in getting something FDA approved. So somebody has to actually put in the money and the time to get that approved and the incentive just likely is not there. Um, another uh, attendee asked if there's any anti-VEGF eye drops currently researched. There are some being researched, but um, <clears throat> there have been none so far that have been found to penetrate uh, to the level necessary to manage the macular degeneration. The question, another question is whether there's generic ranibizumab or afibrocept. Currently, there is no generic um, of any of the biologics. 
uh, bevacizumab is considered a um, generic by some, but it's off label and it has um, it has never been FDA approved for use in the eye. Um, there are biosimilars, two biosimilars that have become available in the U.S. for ranibizumab. This year, there are other biosimilars worldwide available, um, but uh, no, no generics for uh, ranibizumab or aflibercept. Um, somebody asked, what are some special OCT findings where you would not choose bevacizumab for macular degeneration treatment uh, and would go to another drug? For example, I've heard that serous pigment epithelial uh, detachment responds better to afibercept. Um, <clears throat> you know, there are some small case reports and uh, studies that have talked about this but there are no large trials um, showing us whether um, one medication works better than another. Uh, in the case of diabetic macular edema, in specific instances uh, with specific visual acuity findings, they have found um, that aflibercept may work better, but um, these, are, these are not overall or worldwide adoption um, of these standards. Uh, another attendee asks, any concerns in patients and cardiovascular accidents um, with um, port-delivered anti-VEGF? You know, uh, I think that's a great question. I think uh, we all know that patients uh, receiving anti-VEGFs may be at a slightly increased risk of uh, cardiovascular as cerebrovascular accidents. Um, we also know that these patients, um, because of the systemic findings and because of the age, uh, are also at increased risk for these. Um, so I think it's an individual question that physicians have to uh, discuss with their patients. Again, uh, macular degeneration, diabetic macular edema, these are heterogeneous diseases and they involve individual approach. Um, our time is coming to an end. I want to thank everyone for attending. We had a lot of attendees and we had a lot of questions, so I'm sorry we were not able to get to all of the questions, but I hope that we can uh, continue this discussion in the future because I know there's a lot of interest. Thank you again.